Hi there. I hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. I did, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But first let me say, I find it very gratifying how many new heroes we have out there. There are many patriots that are stepping up to the plate, and these are new people, people we haven't heard of, new heroes. And we'll likely know, in terms of the election, how this all turns out in two weeks or so. I feel moderately hopeful, but I don't know how this is gonna turn out. We really, at this point, can't know. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you believe one way or the other, or you're discouraged one way or the other, and you think this should happen a certain way. I, I don't believe that. I don't think that way. I cross bridges when I come to them. We don't know what life has in store for us on a personal level for this country. But what I do like is that a lot of people are waking up. A lot of people. And I, I find the, like those hearings in Pennsylvania about the election fraud, people know about the election fraud. Half the country knows about the election fraud. And no matter what happens, people are gonna know that there was election fraud. Because what do we know? I, I know what I know. Trump won this election in a landslide. And because he won in a, land, in a landslide, um, they got sloppy with the election fraud. And the election fraud apparently wasn't everywhere, but maybe it was. <laughs> that, we don't know. But we do know it occurred in certain battleground states. And... If you get a chance to listen to those hearings in Pennsylvania, they're on YouTube. And I think some international stations uh, have played it. Like I was watching it from The Sun. Isn't that in Great Britain? And The Independent, I don't know where that's from. But, you know, it's several hours. But it's, it's actually very, very interesting to listen to. And you can't ignore that. People know about it. And what happens in Pennsylvania, as one of the things Steve Bannon points out a lot, if you have this overturned by a legislature in any of the states, this could start a domino effect. But they've got to act fast. And I think things will happen next week. You know, it's kind of hard to get things to happen during Thanksgiving week. But there's a lot of people fighting and new people coming along. Um, I find that gratifying. Whether we'll win this battle, because it is a battle, we will not have lost the war. Because everybody's waking up. And that, to me, is key. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting? For example, in the Federalist, and you can find this on thefederalist.com, and it said, five more ways Joe Biden magically outperformed election norms. So even if <laughs> you don't go for any of the other stuff, there's just too many weird things that happened. Too many weird things that can't be explained. Um, mainly because it happened at the, just at the top of the ticket with Biden. They didn't have time to work it at the lower levels. So from so many different angles, there was fraud. So many different angles. And that's not going to go away. More and more people will find out about this. Now, whether we find out about it enough in time, that has to be dealt with. Because you cannot have people thinking that their vote does not matter. That is a big, big problem. And in fact, that is such a big problem that I think... Trump has to win the election for that reason alone. Now, whether that will convince the state legislatures, I, I don't know why they have to have courage. How can you have not have courage to fix this? How will your voters ever trust you? Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the state legislatures, 
What that is is that in the places where this fraud was so extensive, they could vote, the state legislatures can say, it's clear that the overcount and these mail-in votes, that there were this much, whatever, Trump won. So we're gonna, we can appoint the electors now, and the electors for, for Trump. Now, of course, everybody will, oh, but otherwise people are disenfranchised. Otherwise people are disenfranchised. So I don't see how they cannot do that. What I find kind of interesting is like, for example, for the Pennsylvania legislatures, Jenna Ellis was educating them on what their constitutional rights are. A lot of people don't understand the Constitution. So we'll see what happens there. Certainly if you live in these states, and that's Arizona, Pennsylvania, all the Georgia, you need to write the Republicans and say, hey, <laughs> you gotta vote for this. You gotta vote for the electors because this was a bad election and you gotta fix this. I mean, that's one of the things we can do. Now, as for me personally, and that's really, you know, this, this site, I'm not gonna get into all the details of it because there are so many good sources. And I've talked about the sources. One that I watch every day is Steve Bannon's War Room. He has good people on. He's generally pretty upbeat. I, I watch a whole lot of others. And many of you have sent me links, which I appreciate. Um, I'm, I'm really mostly interested in links where I can get information. I don't need links that talk about how disappointed they are or this or that. that that doesn't help me any I don't want to listen to people who are oh our country's ruined whatever I don't like that I don't like that kind of talk I don't like it in my life I've never done that in my life I don't like people who just complain I mean the only time you complain and this is true for everything in life is when you're trying to deal with a problem or you're very upset about something. You know, to tell a friend to say, I'm really upset about this, or I'm really down about this, or, or whatever, you first have to lay out how you feel in order to deal with it. But to just wallow in it and just feed it, that's not for me. And I don't wanna hear it. I don't, I'm not interested in being around people who look at life that way. I'm very happy, like with a friend, to discuss a problem and how they feel about something and how they're struggling with something. But if it's just to, as I used to say, piss and moan and not to solve it, I, I don't want that. Doesn't help. And as a result, I've had a pretty happy, happy life. Now, <laughs> one of the things I find interesting as I look at my brain I, I really can't picture, <laughs> I literally cannot picture Biden, Harris, or whatever, as being president. I, I just, it, it's like, it, it doesn't compute. And now I'll cross that bridge when I, if and when it comes to that, but right now it just simply doesn't compute. And so I'm just not even <laughs> going there. But let me just say, there's, there's always chaos in a new administration, but the sheer chaos and incompetence and the infighting, the Democrats will have tremendous infighting because if you don't have a strong leader on the top to quell it, to say, this is what we're gonna do, folks, the infighting will be huge, huge. And also, we won't go away. So I don't know what is the best thing for this country. I really don't. And those who say, oh, it's God's plan, whatever, that Trump be reelected. I think you're just setting yourself up because you don't know what God's plan is if, you, if your mind works that way that God has a plan. I mean, when I have prayer, it's a prayer to be strong. It's a prayer to do the right thing. It's a prayer for other people to have strength. That's what I think you do. Because look at all the terrible things that happen to people. You know, especially like somebody who has a child die or something. 
I mean, God didn't plan that. Nobody planned that. That's what happened. So I don't go with this that, oh, Trump is there because of God or, or this or that. You know, you can believe it, okay? But then what do you do if Trump goes away or Trump doesn't get reelected because of fraud? Do you think that God planned that? No, no. But I, I'm, not, I'm not here to get in the way of your beliefs about what God's plan is. Whatever gives you strength, whatever gets you through this, that's the important thing. And we all have our own way of doing that. And people with strong faith, I think, have an advantage, a big advantage. Let me say something about Thanksgiving. I don't know if many of you know, but in California, Gavin Newsom had all these rules. Well, my lovely part of my family in the Central Valley, they don't bother with that. And neither did I. So I drove there. And actually, what was kind of interesting was the longest drive, it was about three and a half hours, that I've done since it's sold. Well, I went there last Thanksgiving, but I, I hadn't actually taken any long trips in my car. So it was kind of fun because I, I love to drive fast. <laughs> I, I mean, it was fun. It was just fun drive. I did notice that, um, like I stopped at one place to get some coffee. And I thought, I saw all these people. This is along the freeway, you know, the 99 freeway. Uh, I saw all these people with masks on. So I thought, oh, really? They're gonna require a mask? So I, I, I put my mask in my pocket, but nobody said anything, but I was the only one. Well, I waited in line to use the bathroom and then to get the coffee. I was the only one who didn't have a mask on. And I thought, wow. I mean, to me, this <laughs> it's like I'm on another planet to see all the people with masks. Because let me say something about masks. Everything that I've read, and you really have to go back to before this started, before it became politicized, because it's a symbol. It's a symbol. And it's a way to keep people afraid. But everything I know about masks is that they don't help at all. Let me repeat that. They don't help at all. I'm convinced by what I've read and the studies that are now hard to find, but they were available. But, as I told my friend Kathy, they're kind of like a rabbit's foot. If people are scared of this thing, they're scared of COVID, when you put the mask on, it's like having, you know, your little lucky rabbit's foot. You're protected. <laughs> well, clearly you're not, because why would you have an uptick in cases? And obviously, the uptick in cases. Who cares about cases? I mean, are people even allowed to have a cold anymore? One in the Thanksgiving gathering, one of my nieces and her family, because the son had a cold, they didn't feel that they should come. And it just seemed sad to me. But they, they thought they were being polite. I mean, I don't care. I, actually, I saw them the day before, because we, we rode Kaylee, Kaylee's horse, and I, I rode the horse, and it was fun. I mean, I didn't like run, ride the horse in any major way, but it was fun being on a horse. And he was there, gave him a hug. I mean, <laughs> I don't care. I mean, can a kid have a cold? Oh, please. But, you know, they thought they were being polite. And that's another thing I, I find about the whole COVID. People think they're being polite, so they'll say, you know, somebody was exposed, and I think I should let you know, and this and that. My own personal feeling is that every time you do that, you are contributing to this fear. Every time you do that, you're contributing to this fear. I refuse to be part of it. I refuse to be part of like notifying people. <laughs> when they tried to do some of the contact tracing, people didn't want to tell them. 
tell the callers who they had seen or whatever. And I think that's one of the things we have to do. We have to refuse to do this. It's a way to control people, control their movements, control who they see. And imagine that trying to take away our Thanksgiving. Well, my Thanksgiving was the same as every other Thanksgiving, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Nobody wore a mask, of course. Part of my family is like really cool because they're all, they're all offspring of Denise, my younger sister, and she raised them right. <laughs> Anyway, it was great seeing Denise. She's just like so cool. Anyway, it was it was just fun seeing everybody. And my brother-in-law gave me a hat. I'm not gonna put it on because it'll mess up my hair. But I got my Trump hat, so I'm gonna hang it up in here and hang it up where you can see it in the front door if people come. Now, one of the things I'm gonna link, and it's called the pinned comment, so it'll be the first one that shows up in the comments to this. I listened to an excellent, inspiring, well, I say it's excellent because it, I totally agree with it. <laughs> and that is from Heather McDonald and it's about safety. And about what, by putting an emphasis on safety, we're like feminizing our culture. Like why did I become a feminist a long time ago? I didn't want to take away the male culture, if you will. I wanted women who wanted to do certain things to have the opportunity to do it. Like when I joined the Air Force and I could do electronics, women who want to fly combat planes, I want them to be able to do it. Women who want to be CEOs, I want them to be able to do it. It was never about feminizing our culture, but that's what we're doing. We're Demasculine, demask. <laughs> well, anyway, we're taking away masculinity. We're making masculinity a bad thing, and she talks about this. So, it, she was interviewed on Steve Bannon's War Room. So I will pin it in just so you don't have to watch the whole thing, but just her talk. I found it very, very inspiring, and I could not agree more. That's Heather McDonald. You know, she's been excellent on. The Diversity Delusion, I read that book, but she's also the ones that really know the cop numbers about that sort of thing, you know, like the, this whole idea that cops are killing blacks, unarmed blacks is not true. So she has the war on police or the war on cops, I forgot what it's called. I haven't read that book, but I've read articles. Anyway, I highly recommend it. But you know, it's interesting because when people don't wear masks, it spreads. So Lindsay pointed out when we went to the playground with the kids, Tyson, Kaylee, and Presley, and oh, we have so much fun playing. I have so much fun playing with those kids. They climb everything, they do everything. They're fearless. But nobody at this playground was wearing a mask. And in fact, I think if somebody came to that playground and had a mask, they'd feel weird in the same way that people looked at me when I didn't wear a mask at that Arco Food Mart or whatever I stopped at on my way to Clovis, Fresno area. But I didn't care. I don't care. I don't mind being the one outlier. It just doesn't bother me. I don't need, I don't care if people look at me I'm proud of the fact that I don't wear a mask. So if, if that bothers you and you want to fit in, well, if you, if you give into that, in my mind, you're spreading fear. So as much as possible, now obviously there's sometimes you have to do it. And maybe you don't want to make a stink. You don't have to create a big, you can just make it difficult, make your mask slip down, whatever works. So I was ready if I was told by an employee of the store that I would need to put the mask on, I would have put it on real quick and then took, take, taken it off as soon. But nobody said anything. They just, people just looked at me. So I'm okay with that.
I've mentioned this before, and this is going along with Heather McDonald. You know, just remove the word safety from your vocabulary. I think we need to do this. Otherwise, we're gonna have a real deep change in our culture, and it's already happening. This whole idea that we, the most important thing is to be safe. No, that's not the most important thing. So the way in which I fight that, is I don't talk about safety. So when I'm leaving on my drive back home, beautiful family, Lindsay, Mike, I mean, they're such great parents, they're so fabulous. And the three kids, Tyson, Kaylee, and Presley, have a great trip, have a good drive. You know, they, they're not talking about, I mean, I, I always say, don't ever say, to please, to me, have a safe trip. Why would you say that? Why would you even plant that fear of, of course I'm gonna be safe, whatever that means. I'm gonna be prudent. I mean, I've lived this long. I've done a lot of things. I'm not gonna do anything that's gonna jeopardize my life or my safety, but I don't need to be reminded of that. And I don't think you need to remind kids of that, except for specific things like don't cross the street without looking for the cars. That's a very specific thing, and I've mentioned that before. But don't just give these generalized, oh, be safe, be safe. What the heck does that mean? Just don't talk that way. We're going in that direction and it's not healthy. It's not healthy. It just creates fear. So one of the things I did, which is always interesting because I don't watch these movies <laughs> that are for kids, all these animated shows, you know, but there was the Frozen 2. So Kaylee and Presley, you can see they really liked it. And I can see why. The two main female characters, they were leaders. They, they did exciting things. Although it is kind of weird that it's about ice and stuff like that. But I asked Tyson, and he goes, ah, he didn't really like it that much. He wasn't so sure. But the girls loved it. But then I understood why. Now, and the reason I'm mentioning this is I think it's important when kids are watching these shows, if you can, when you're watching it with them, just point out certain things because there is subtle messaging going on. I mean, in the same way that when I was a kid and saw Bambi and cried, it was so awful. The hunter killed Bambi's mom. Nobody talked to me at that time. And nobody told me that wasn't right. And yet my dad would hunt, but why didn't they talk to me? So you need to look at what the message was. And I found the message of Frozen 2 except for the fact that the women were active, took action, solved problems, I found it somewhat appalling. So the women were, were good. They fixed that problem. Because <laughs> when I was young, a lot of times the women, they didn't like do anything. They were just like somebody's girlfriend or they were, while the men fought and did, you know, exciting things, the women would just sort of, ah, you know, and the guys would protect them. But they had like the male, and he was trying to, I guess, propose to Anna. I think that was her name, the other, not Elsa, the main one, but the other gal. His whole thing was he's a boyfriend and he wants to propose to her and he's too chicken to. He keeps bungling it. Or, and that's all he's thinking about. He's thinking about his role as a boyfriend as a potential husband. It's like, hello, he's not helping to solve their problem. In fact, at the very key time when Anna and Elsa were like fighting and to solve this problem, he's like off in the forest trying to get help from another guy about how do I propose. And I, <laughs> it was cute. I said to Presley or, or Kayla, I go, she shouldn't marry that guy. He's incompetent or whatever. And she just looks at me like, she hadn't thought of that. But it's like, he's, what a terrible thing. Now in the end, he, he gets braver. But I thought, why are they, of course Tyson's not gonna like this story so much. 
who is there, who's the exciting male characters that he can identify with, that are strong, that are fighting? Why couldn't they all have been fighting these battles? So, and in the end, here's what I found interesting, and it kind of reminded me of the movie Avatar, which is very anti-human. But this was, they found out that the real bad guy had been an ancestor of Anna and Elsa, who was the grandfather. And he was like the white guy, and he had built a dam. He had tricked the native people, and the dam was the evil thing. Wow. It's like our ancestors with the Declaration of Independence, with our Constitution, they're the evil ones. I mean, isn't that the same thing? But the native cultures, they were wonderful. But the sign of technological progress, the dam, that was the problem. Dams are wonderful. I mean, so Anna, in order to fix it, she's got to destroy the dam. This is what kids are watching. These movies are hits. She's destroying the dam. Hello, Antifa, pulling down statues. How is this any different? So, I don't think they, they thought of that, but of course, you know, they got their Aunt Deborah there, great Aunt Deborah, and I'm like <laughs> pointing all this stuff out. But, I mean, that doesn't mean they're gonna become members of Antifa or kids watching it, but what happens is this is a subtle messaging, okay? It's not just the schools, it's the movies. It's the subtle messaging. So Lindsay and I afterwards, and, and the kids, but mostly Lindsay and I were watching the, the um, I don't know what you call them, outtakes or, but anyway, they had interviews, there were places where you could click and hear the interviews with how they made the movie, who the people were, and it was kind of, guy was talking in this gal and I said you could just tell looking at this guy he's a Biden voter I mean Trump derangement syndrome you could just tell by the way he <laughs> and then she just laughed because it was true it was true I mean so these people are taking their philosophy and they're putting it on kids what I'm hoping comes out of some of this is that we get new channels, we get new movies, we get new heroes for kids, patriotic heroes, kids that love our country, stories about how we love our country. This may take some time, but meanwhile, I mean, kids should be able to watch these shows, they're exciting, they're fun, but I encourage all the parents or older people to watch it with them and just point this out, just to put a stop to it. Just to, just to make them aware of what they're watching. And of course, it's always about nature's good. So there's no technology. You know, they have their messages with birds and whatever. And of course, and then Anna becomes like the, ma the monarch. So they don't even have elections, <laughs> but this is okay. This is okay. Again, it reminds me of Avatar. And the native cultures are good. So in closing, I'd like to say, I don't like being defensive. If the left makes an attack, I, I don't care. I don't care. I don't think we should use their framing I don't think we, we're, we're big enough. We're half the country. We are half the country. We don't have to respond to their attacks because they're, they're setting it on. And one of the things I really like is now we're fighting in terms of the election. We are fighting and say, show that you're not. <laughs> we're putting them on the defensive. This was a steal. They stole the election. Biden cheated. The Biden side cheated. Prove that you didn't cheat. That's, that's being on the offensive. We need to be on the 
offensive. And another thing, in thinking about how I've evolved over time, one of the greatest things for me in my life, and I admit, you know, I can do that now, I have the freedom to do that, but the nicest thing is to not need something from someone outside yourself. And what I mean by that is, well, I take the whole concept of networking for work. When you're networking for work, what are you doing? You're not really meeting people because you really just want to meet those people. You're meeting them because they could help you in your work. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but what a strain. A little over a decade ago, I was involved with Caltech, and I've been involved with Caltech since then. But I got on one of these chairs councils, which was fabulous. And I worked very hard to get on other chairs councils, and I, I managed to get on two more. And this was wonderful. It gave me a connection with science, but there was, there was like a striving in it. I cared who I was meeting. I cared who I impressed. I cared how I got on these. Well, over time, I've cared less, and I certainly don't really care now. I mean, I don't, I don't like the whole academic community anymore. It's not just Caltech, it's others. I don't need it anymore. So I was thinking, do I really even want to, if they open up the meetings again, do I really even want to go? And I thought, well, I'll go once because it is pretty cool to sit around a table and have them give the presentation right then. I mean, that was nice. But I, I could kind of go either way. It used to be very, very important to me. But during this whole shutdown, and they had a Zoom meeting, which was, as I mentioned last time, I, I did do one Zoom meeting, and it was so dystopian, even though the information was interesting. But there's so much good information on science now on the web, just like in YouTube videos. You can learn about anything. You can hear lectures. You can do whatever you want. So do I really need to go in person? So during the shutdown, I got this email that the head of the development, this new person, you know, they, they want to change how they do these chairs councils. And quite frankly, it's to make it much more onerous. I mean, I've contributed a lot of money to Caltech. I mean, not like some people contribute, but it's still a, a good amount. But now they want to make it where you have to do this and you have terms and you have this and you have that. So, I gotta tell you, it was a pretty cool feeling for me for it not to matter. So they wrote me a nice email, not a nice or whatever, and I said, I really enjoyed my decade long involvement with Caltech, but I'm, I don't wanna do these I don't want to do it this way. I liked it the other way, but so I understand new people are coming on and that's great, but it's not for me. Thanks, but no thanks. And that's it. I wrote back. And that feeling of freedom to not need to be on those chairs councils. So I'll have to change my bio because I got it on my bio. You know, it was a, it was a part of my identity in this first 10 years of year of 2000 you know what is your identity who are you I mean when I stopped working full-time that was a big switch for me because my work identity you know to say I was in the Air Force you know to say I was a satellite systems engineer to say I was at the Pentagon uh, to say I did this and say I worked at this place and that place that was a big part of my identity and then later it became being involved in Caltech and being on these chairs councils, which was really kind of cool. I don't need it anymore. I don't need it. Now you could say, is it my identity being on YouTube? Yes, but the only reason I do it is because it's good for me. I enjoy it. I enjoy thinking about what am I going to say every week? How am I going to... I, I want to spread... 
what is it I want to spread? I certainly don't want to spread downer stuff. How do you deal with life's difficulties? How do you deal with it? Kind of like as a motivational speaker, speaker, I've kind of always liked that. So maybe it's that. But if it wasn't of any use to anyone, then I can do something else. But meanwhile, I love that it's sort of like I have, I don't know, I usually get a little over a thousand views. And these are kind of like friends. And maybe my style is not for you. Maybe you want to piss and moan. Go for it. I'm not for you. But if you want to think about where do we go from here, how do we stay strong, how do we make this work for us, and I love, love having you on, and I appreciate all of you who enjoy these talks. I love that you leave me messages during the week. I see them all, and as you can see this week, I couldn't respond because I was focused on Lindsay and the kids and what I was doing at Thanksgiving, and usually when I'm doing that, I, I don't like get on my phone too much. I pay attention to who I'm with and give them my full attention. And really with life, you have to do that. So I thank you. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I am gonna pray that people have strength, especially the people in these legislatures. I wanna see what they're gonna do. And I want the information to be out there I want us to spread the information. I want people to know what's going on. And we're going to make this work for us one way or the other. This is a great country, and we're going to make it work for us. And we'll all have a lot more to talk about next week. Talk to you then.